Well, one of the things that uh, brought me here and that we're all uh, familiar with and understand is that our world is very tightly coupled now. We have very dense networks, things happen fast, and as a result of that connectivity and that tight coupling, we seem to be more and more vulnerable to what specialists call cascading failures, kind of like you see when a row of dominoes falls over. The first one gets knocked over and it takes out the rest. It's amazing how often we're seeing this kind of thing now. Uh, you know, we had uh, a number of years ago an a, a outbreak of SARS in southern China and within a week it was in Toronto and practically shut down the medical system in this city, spread right across the planet. We had a financial crisis over the last few years that began in a relatively what should have been a relatively isolated portion of, a, of, yes, a major economy, the United States, but it was in the housing sector. But within about a year, every single economy in the world tipped into recession simultaneously, the first simultaneous economic downturn in economic history since the Great Depression. And again, an example of how tight coupling produces a kind of synchronicity of events in the world. <clears throat> uh, I often think about the... the uh, uh, the, the phenomenon of cascading failures in terms of uh, uh, tailgating on a, on a highway at high speed. You know what it's like, we all do it, we're uh, traveling very fast, we want to get somewhere and we, we're following the car in front of us very closely and perhaps everybody else around us is doing it. And then, probably hasn't happened to any of you, but it's quite possible somebody makes a mistake. They're talking away on their Blackberry, which they're not supposed to be doing in Ontario anymore. Uh, or maybe even worse, texting something in and switching lanes at the same time and before you know it, you have uh, a, you know, a 60 car pileup. And that's the function of the fact that there's no slack or buffering capacity between the cars. There's not enough space for any one individual to respond to a sudden perturbation in the system to, to save themselves. It doesn't happen often, but the results are really spectacular. When, when it does happen. And I would say systemically, when we look around the world, where we're, whether we're looking at uh, our epidemiological systems, uh, our economic systems, our electrical grids, uh, our transportation networks, our information networks, this phenomenon of a sudden flip or shift into a kind of collapse sequence or a cascading failure seems to be becoming increasingly common. Well, that's the first point I want to make about some, uh, some of the general phenomena in our world. Uh, let me go on to the second, which is to emphasize that we're actually not facing one problem, whether in your businesses or in our societies or human civilization as a whole. There's a whole bunch of things happening at the same time, what I call converging stresses. It's a bit like we're standing in the middle of a very large parking lot, stretching out to infinity. And we look out and we see 10 Mack trucks coming towards us simultaneously at high speed. And we think, oh, this isn't very good. But we look at them and we think, well, we look at the front bumper one and it says energy. And we say, OK, well, we can get out of the way by stepping over here. And then we look at the front bumper of another and it says climate. And that sort of prevents our escape route over here, so we have to move somewhere else. And we look at another and another and another. And we realize that actually it's pretty difficult to get away. The natural human response in that kind of circumstance of converging crisis or converging stress is to uh, uh, cover your ears, close your eyes, and roll up in a little ball on the pavement and hope it all goes away. And to a large extent, I think that's what we're doing uh, at the level of human civilization and at the level of our societies. And to the extent that we do try to think about the problems that we're addressing, we want to isolate them. We want to separate them and look at them individually. But really, it turns out that the whole is much bigger than the sum of the parts. We actually have to look at the whole. We have to think about how these bits and pieces are interacting. Climate and energy, for instance, can't be separated from each other. They're fundamentally integrated and interdependent problems, and they have to be addressed simultaneously. Now, this phenomenon of converging crisis turns out to be very important because it can produce, as I suggest in the slide, a situation of crisis and breakdown, overload and breakdown, overloading our coping cap capacity, our, our ability to understand the situation, to respond effectively, 
It turns out if you look at the great, some of the great instances of societal breakdown in history, uh, the French Revolution in the 19th century, excuse me, the 18th century, late 18th century, the uh, Russian Revolution in the early part of the 20th century, more recently, let's say, the Iranian Revolution in 1979. Analysis of those events shows that the systems broke down, the institutions broke down because they were being hit by multiple shocks simultaneously. And the, the governance structure and the state simply couldn't cope. And in many respects, that's exactly the kind of situation I think that we're creating around the world today. The situation of converging crises that our institutions and our procedures, our bureaucracies, our corporations, our social fabric in many cases can't can cope with. This is going to be most obvious in the peripheral areas of the world, the poorest parts with the weakest governments, the most corrupt regimes, the weakest economies. That's where that kind of disintegration is most visible at first but eventually it might start to affect us in the core of the world system. So the second is this, is this important point that we are not dealing with one thing happening, we're dealing with a whole bunch of things happening simultaneously. And the third point that I want to make, general point, is about complexity. And I'll spend a little bit more time on this. We really have changed in some respects the fundamental characteristics of our world in the last few decades. And I think as a result we need to shift from seeing the world as composed of machines to seeing it as composed of complex systems. And I want to spend a bit of time talking about what this means. When I talk to my students about this, I have a clock that looks almost identical to this. I take it into, into the classroom and I put it down on the seminar table and say, I can take this thing apart. I can break it into its, all its bits and pieces, its widgets, its cog wheels and its springs and its sprockets and screws and bushings and bearings and things and I can understand how everything fits together and very precise understanding and I can put it back together again and if it doesn't work and by the way it makes sense to say that it doesn't work we know when, when a machine works properly and when it doesn't work properly that's a sensible thing to say when it doesn't work we can attribute the problem to a particular piece that might be out of place or bent or something like that. So we can engage in a kind of analysis to reduce it to its pieces, understand it very precisely and put it back together. And in many respects, that's the way we want to manage the world. And that's the way our public servants, our corporate leaders think about the world that surrounds them. And in many cases, it's a perfectly reasonable set of assumptions to use. That we can have a very precise understanding it, we can predict the behavior of the machine, and if it doesn't work properly, and the machine being uh, <clears throat> a particular institution, a hospital or something, or an economy, and if it doesn't work properly, we can identify where the problem is, tweak it, change it, remove the part, replace it or something, and it will work effectively. Well, I think what we're seeing in the world today is that increasingly the systems that we're dealing with aren't like that. And I just want to distinguish quickly between them. So machines, as I've suggested, can be taken apart. They can be analyzed. And they can be fully understood. They are ultimately no more than the sum of their parts. They exhibit normal behavior. We know when they work correctly. And that behavior usually is an equilibrium behavior. When things are chugging along, they stay more or less the same uh, for an extended period of time. Most importantly, they show proportionality of cause and effect. Small causes cause small effects. Big causes cause big effects. And as a result of these three characteristics, they can be managed because their behavior is predictable. When we get to complex systems, though, the world is a very different place. These might be ecological systems. They might be the world economy. They might be things like electrical grids or maybe even air traffic systems under certain circumstances. They are ultimately more than the sum of their parts. They have what specialists call emergent properties. You put everything together and all of a sudden, excuse me, all of a sudden something happens that you wouldn't have anticipated in advance. It's almost a bit like, you know, this mechanical clock, you put it back together and it sprouts a couple of legs and say, says, see ya, and walks out of the room. Wow, where did that come from? You know, that would be an emergent phenomenon. Frequently, complex systems do something that is just entirely surprising. 
they can flip from one pattern of behavior to another. They have what specialists call multiple equilibria. Again, we saw in the world economy, we flipped from a stable state to a turbulent state, back to something we might call sort of a quasi-stable state, but all of this seemed to happen in the blink of an eye. And fundamentally, complex systems show disproportionality of cause and effect. Small causes can cause really big changes in the system. And sometimes a big change in the system doesn't seem to do very much at all. And this is because of certain things I won't go into today. Uh, uh, feedback effects, self-reinforcing patterns of causation, synergies where, where you get multiplicative effects across causes. But usually you can, you can take a complex system and look inside and find out that there are things that amplify small behaviors in certain circumstances to produce very big changes. And the result of these three characteristics is that complex systems cannot be easily managed because their behavior is almost entirely unpredictable, at least in certain circumstances. This has to lead to a very different way of approaching our problems. And this is one of the most important, I think, certainly one of the most central arguments that I make in my work and have made in my work over the last decade or so. So fundamentally, in terms of our business models, it means that we're moving from a world of risk to a world of uncertainty. You may be somewhat familiar with this distinction that arises from the work of a very well-known American economist at the University of Chicago by the name of Knight. It's called the Knightian distinction between risk and uncertainty. He did his work originally back in the 1920s. It was incorporated into the thinking of John Maynard Keynes, and then it sort of disappeared. But we're finding that it's now coming back with a vengeance, and the distinction is being made by quite a few people. In a world of risk, we can have enough information, or we do have enough information available to us to say something probabilistically about the range of possible paths that any given system, say an economy, a corporation even, might move along in the future. So we can identify what the possible pathways into the future are. And along each of those pathways, we have sufficient information to be able to make some estimates about costs and benefits to, to us uh, if we move along a particular pathway. In a world of uncertainty, we don't have sufficient data to estimate costs and benefits. We don't even have sufficient data to make some judgments about what the possible pathways are. The future is significantly opaque. 